Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Ryan. And this is Daniel with Propelio. And today we've got some more information coming your way where we try to be as content rich in education as possible with the least amount of pitches as possible. We always try. We try. That said, Propelio. Subtle pitch. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we talking about today? We're going to be discussing, we provide, Propelio provides five different types of lead lists mm -hmm. and we do get regular questions and we actually had a, one of our viewers specifically ask us, can we discuss and review what type of lead lists we have and Helen, how right? they work? It was Helen, I believe. Yeah, Helen, this Helen Sons. This for you. This one is for you. So Propelio, just to start off, I want to explain that we definitely do our lead lists different than your average list provider. Uh, we literally go out and source these properties through the public record, through county record daily, Monday through Friday. Uh, we cross-reference and compile our lists and release them often within 24 hours of them being uh, recorded on public record. So our lists are pretty fresh. I mean, we, we really put a lot of effort into making sure you have the freshest possible lists out there. But there's confusion from people as to what types of lists they are. So right. that's what we're going to talk about today. Awesome. And, and just because whether you are or not a Propelio user, this information is still applicable. Yes, because there are going to be areas where we don't provide these types of lists and you may need to source these types of lists on your own. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to break down today what these lists are, your best marketing methods for approaching them, and you know some of the nuances of each type of list. So really to get into this, let's just start off with the foreclosure lists. We have right. five lists that we provide, three of which are pre-foreclosure leads. Those are going to be your Liz Pendens, your Notice of Trustee Sales, and your Appointments of Substitute Trustee. So let's go ahead and break those down. For those of you that would like to learn more about that, though, we do have a, several re recorded shows on pre-foreclosure, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna talk about those three lists specifically in that pre-foreclosure class. So if you wanna go watch an hour and a half to two hour long class, maybe we'll drop that in the links when we're done with this, mm -hmm. but uh, you can learn a lot more about the pre-foreclosure side. But for me to explain to you what those lists are, I do need to talk about foreclosures for a moment, okay. but this is not gonna be a foreclosures class. I'm gonna first start out with, we have 50 states in the union. With 50 states being in the union, every single one of those states have a different foreclosure process, but they're predominantly controlled by one or two things. That's either going to be a deed of trust or a mortgage. That's also going to be known as a judicial foreclosure, mortgages, or a non-judicial foreclosure, which are going to be your deeds of trust. So let's focus on deeds of trust first. Okay. Deeds of trust are used in non-judicial states, and deeds of trust are the security instrument that gives the bank the power to initiate a foreclosure in the event of a default. Okay, so that's kind of straightforward. If you've ever bought a house, you're gonna sign a real estate lien note, also known as a promissory note. You're gonna sign a, door, a mortgage or a deed of trust if you, got, if you got a lien, and you're gonna sign the deed to the property, and then you're also gonna sign a whole bunch of disclosures. But the two primary things that I'm gonna look at are gonna be the real estate lien note and the deed of trust. With the deed of trust, there is a trustee named on that deed of trust when you purchase the property. Let's say in 1993, you decide to buy a property and you're in a non-judicial state and you go out and you sign your real estate lien note. You're also gonna sign that deed of trust and that trustee is going to have a trustee named in it. Mm -hmm. 1993, I just bought a house. Trustee is named. 10 years later, I stopped making my, my payments. I go into default and the bank is ready to, to move forward with foreclosing on me. Well, the trustee on a deed of trust is the person responsible for enforcing mm -hmm. that trust. Well, what's the probability that 10 years later, Bank of America is gonna call that original trustee up and say, you know what, initiate a foreclosure and get this process started. It is almost incredibly unlikely that that will actually occur. More than likely what's gonna happen is Bank of America is gonna contact their go-to foreclosing attorney that handles all of their foreclosure, foreclosures inside of that specific area and says, hey, I need you to foreclose on this property. But if Bank of America calls that attorney up, that attorney doesn't have rights to foreclose on that property because he's not what? On the trust. The trustee. He's not the trustee. So what does Bank of America need to do? They need to get an appointment of trustee. There you go. That is exactly what needs to be done. And that is the whole reason why I feel that appointments of substitute trustee are likely the best lead source for pre-foreclosure properties. So when, 
the list as a whole, all it is is that notification that this has been changed over. But do you also get the, the who that trustee person is as well? Yeah, you'll find out who the trustee is. There's going to be an appointment of substitute trustee. Sometimes it's called a removal of trustee. Okay. Uh, there's several different ways to word it. So depending on what county you're in. And like I said, this works in non-judicial states. So if you're in a judicial state like Florida, New York, Illinois, this is not going to work for you. But we do have a... a, a um, list type that will work for you and we'll talk about that in a moment called list pendants but for those of you in non-judicial states appointments of substitute trustee are gold for you so oh so i have that list now how to work it i can door knock it i can call it i can mail it i can do all the traditional marketing strategies mm -hmm. what about actually trying to hit up the trustee themselves the trustee has no control over the sale of the house. Okay, so there's and no reason to. There, there's no reason initially. Now, if you want to learn more about that, I would go into the foreclosure video that we'll link here in a little while. But the trustee has no power to sell the house outside of the auction. Okay. So you're going to need to contact the homeowner directly and try and secure a contract through the homeowner. But once you've done that, contacting the trustee is marginally important. So I'm going to, you ready for a layup? Oh, yeah. So why is this list so important? Because foreclosures are kind of the low hanging fruit of real estate investors. Everybody knows about them. It's somewhat easy to get a hold of a non -tr of a traditional list, such as uh, another one we're going to talk about here in a little bit, and that is the notice of trustee sale. Totally different list. Don't confuse the notice of trustee sale with the appointment of substitute trustee. But with the appointment of substitute trustee, I need to dig into this list a little bit further and explain how this works. So what we just talked about was an appointment of substitute trustee where the bank wants to foreclose on this property, but the trustee named in the deed of trust is not the attorney that they want to use. Therefore, they're going to appoint a new one. Now, this is where things get a little bit confusing for people. And I need to make sure I slow down and make this as clear as I possibly can. At least in Texas, I can't speak for all the 49, 50 states, but in Texas, an appointment of substitute trustee is not a regulated document, as in the state does not dictate when, how, where, and why that document is filed. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, and I'm going to use a big word that I don't know the definition to, but it sounds like it fits. It's an ancillary byproduct of, did I, use, did I, did I do a good job? Somebody fact check me there. What's ancillary mean? It sounded right. But what I bust out the glossary today. That's like two or three syllables there. I mean, you almost think I'd graduate high school for that mm -hmm. one. But... What we're looking at here is since it is not a regulated document, there's no way for me to definitively tell anybody at what point in foreclosure was that document filed. So meaning that could be day one of late payment or that could be day seven years behind late payment. That could be anywhere in between. That document can literally be filed hours before the foreclosure. It can be filed multiple of times. You know, it can be filed five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. It can also be filed, and I need to make this very clear, I'm going to pause just to get everybody's attention. An appointment of substitute trustee is not a guaranteed foreclosure. It is not guaranteed to be in foreclosure when that document was filed. So let me point out some other really key things to think about when we're talking about the appointment of substitute trustee. And that is, although from my experience, I have found the majority, the predominant majority of the times a bank files an appointment of substitute trustee, that the seller is in fact in default. Mm -hmm. But there is, and in my opinion, a rare occasion where an appointment of substitute trustee will be filed for no reason outside of default. I mean, for a reason outside of default such as maybe the bank sold the loan and the new note servicer or the new note holder changes the trustee for whatever reason. I find that to be a rare exception versus the rule, but I do need to make it aware that if I send out some solicitations to somebody and say, appointment of substitute trustee, you're in foreclosure, these people may not be in foreclosure. So when you're talking about the appointment of substitute trustees, uh, you know, yes, this is a targeted lead list, but you if you're going to market to it, you need to understand that it's not super targeted. It is, I would say. Or it's targeted, it's, but, there it, are, it's, but there are some misfires. It's targeted with an occasional misfire. You know, you throw a thousand rounds through the pistol and you might have two or three backfires or misfires. Okay. So I, I need to make that clear because I don't want it to become, you know, almost taken as a fact that if an appointment of substitute trustee is filed, that it's taken. taken. 
Great job. I, I have horrible grammar. I mean, if I if I speak much further outside of you know my two syllable words that I think are great, I get I get flustered. Okay. It's, I'm I'm okay with it. I mean, it is what it is. We were, but, we were talking about the the misfiring how it is targeted, but there are occasionally. So basically, what you're saying, if you're going to market to this list, whether it be through tar, uh, direct mail, cold door knocking, calling, slide dialing, door knocking, bandit sign in the front yard. You know, you need to be the majority aware. Majority is going to be, they need to sell or they need to they need to find a solution. That is my experience from my experience of probably close to five to six years of marketing to that list. But I need to go ahead and wrap that up with an, a follow up, and this might help you if you are marketing to this list, getting through some phone calls, getting through some negotiations, getting through some objections when knocking on doors, and that is going to be the simple fact that these people may be behind on payments but they are not aware that they have reached the pre-foreclosure status and that the bank is moving forward with something. It is extremely common for me when I have marketed to these lists to get a phone call and that phone call will go something along the lines of, hey, I just got a letter in the mail talking about foreclosure. I'm not in foreclosure. Okay, I can respect that and I understand why they are reacting to me like this. But I always have to follow that up with a second question, and that is going to be, oh, my apologies, um, can I just ask some questions? Because a document was recently filed in public record that indicates that a foreclosure may be occurring on this property. And I'm, I'm not saying that there is or there isn't, but are you behind on payments? So in, in a way that you could be, you could spin it to where it's actually a benefit to you because if you are the subject matter expert, that is your opportunity to shine and be the first person to enlighten them of their situation. This happens a lot. And what's gonna happen is after I ask that second question, this basic question of, there was a document filed in public record today that indicates that your property may be going to foreclosure. Are you behind on payments? Most of the time when people call me up and say, I'm not in foreclosure, but I follow up with that second question, they'll be like, well, yeah, I'm behind on payments, but the bank's not foreclosed on me yet. That is an open opportunity because you now know that you are the first person to notify these people that the bank is taking the necessary steps to move forward with a foreclosure. So then what I might be able to do is educate that person on what's now going on. Okay, you are behind on payments, but you're saying you're not in foreclosure. Well, let me explain what's happened to you in public record here. The bank has initiated what's called an appointment of substitute trustee, removing the original trustee from the deed of trust that you signed at foreclosure. And that is often a clear indication that the bank is preparing to initiate a foreclosure with you. So what I would anticipate you, Mr. or Mrs. Homeowner, to be seeing here in the very near future is a demand letter coming from the, from the attorney for the bank, forcing you to catch up all past due payments or pay the loan off within the next X amount of days or they will foreclose on you. So I would anticipate you finding that out, but let me go ahead and move forward with some other alternatives for you. Instead of letting that process drag out, Depending on what's going on with your house and, you know, depending on what you personally need out of this house, we can structure several different ways to maximize the time that you have left in the house, mm -hmm. maximize the equity that you're able to secure, we're able to maximize your control in this situation versus allowing this to work on the bank's timeline. None of us want to be in the, in the you know, shadow of the bank, so how about we proactively move forward with several different options and I can explain those to you. When is a good time to meet? Right. Boom, got the property secured. And, and Dan goes into a lot of detail of how to actually wrap up that lead, and negotiate that lead in, in the, the foreclosure class that he did. Uh, we'll drop the link in here soon. Um, but overall, that lead, how, if you had to summarize the appointment of substitute trustee into a 30 second elevator's pitch or, or explanation what would it be appointment of substitute trustee is kind of like a pre pre foreclosure and that if you target it specifically and you become very good at working that lead list and essentially speed is the key to that list you have an advantage over all other foreclosure investors because you will often be targeting a list with knowledge that many other investors don't have what I can do is I can go into a real estate investor meetup group 20, 30, 50, 100 people in that room, and there might be five to 10% of the people in that room that truly understand and know what an appointment of substitute trustee is. So if you go out and you were wanting to target pre-foreclosures, appointment of substitute trustee hands down are where I would invest my time. Perfect, that's what I want. All right, so what's the next one? Okay, so we are or, still talking. Or, sorry, was there anything other, other wrap up on the appointment of substitute trustee? I think that really, 
pretty much shores up what an appointment of substitute trustee is. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's much else for me to talk about on that outside of the full foreclosure investing class, which we're not going to do today, but we will drop a link for that in here in a little bit. So still talking about non-judicial foreclosures, non-judicial. If you're not sure the difference between judicial and non-judicial, go ahead and look it up. Google, Google is my mentor. Uh, judicial versus non-judicial foreclosures. You'll be able to see which states are which. Uh, one of the things that many people don't realize is Texas is both. You know, if you just openly ask the majority of people, they're going to tell you Texas is a non-judicial state, and that is 95% correct. Uh, the remaining 5% revolves around HELOCs, home equity lines of credit, home equity loans. Those are judicial and, more, and handled. Their security instruments are mortgages. So, real short caveat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the bank wants to foreclose. They filed an appointment of substitute trustee. What's next? Mm -hmm. What's next? Uh, we talked about this just a second ago, the bank is going to send out some form of demand letter. That demand letter is going to be a, an acceleration notice. And I talk about Texas a lot, but this is going to be similar wherever you're at in the United States if you're in a non-judicial state. They're going to send out a demand basically saying, give me my money back. <laughs> and in the event that the Mr. or Mrs. Homeowner is unable to get that money back within the specified time range, in Texas being a minimum of 21 days or 20 days, 20 days, then the bank's going to file what's called a notice of trustee sale. Can, can I pause just because I had the funniest thing about it? Can you imagine if the bank gave them like one of those uh, those song cards that was like, when you open it up, it's like, bitch better have my money <laughs> <laughs> for like Rihanna. It's like, if your notice of uh, oh, uh, or whatever, you know, it's yeah. like, give me my, it's like, bitch better have my money. I can just picture like getting one of those letters with like, I mean, with like a nine millimeter get, shell in it. You think they would get a better return if they spent like the dollar 45 <laughs> for a little music box in those envelopes of, uh, that'd be hilarious. Sorry. I was just like, I just didn't want you to think I'm chuckling at you, but I'm chuckling cause like, bitch better have, it was anyway, sorry. <laughs> My bad. So yeah, that would back on topic. I wonder if that'd work for real estate investor marketing. I don't know. You know, find a little jingle that you could throw in there. It's like <laughs> I don't know what it would be, but I'm sure it'd be good. Yeah, we, won't go, we won't go into stereotypes on this show. So <laughs> moving on, getting past that. If you fail to catch up the past due payments, the banks are gonna do what's gonna be called pretty much notice a trustee sale. Some people call it the notice of default. Uh, you know, there's several different terms. Figure out what that term is for your state. Here in Texas, it's almost always going to be called a notice of trustee sale for a mortgage foreclosure. If it is a sheriff sale, uh, you're going to be talking about something a little bit different, but we're going to be talking about mortgage foreclosures for this class. Mm -hmm. That document is called the notice of trustee sale. That is kind of like the final straw. That is the notice to the public that this property is going to go for sale at a specific date, time, and place. Now, the difference between this, the appointment of substitute trustee, is appointment of substitute trustee could be on day one or it could be on day 1,000. Mm -hmm. What are the time guidelines on this thing? There are no time guidelines for when it has to be filed. And I'm not a lawyer. Prephrase all this, and we are talking specifically in this question about Texas. There's no guidelines that say you have to do it you know, at least six months early, 10 months early. But, but there is... The date. There is a minimum time that you have to do it. I might be phrasing this wrong, so let me erase that and just basically say, in the state of Texas, they have to provide a minimum of a 21-day notice. But it at least has the sale date. It will have the sale date, the location, and the time of the sale. So it could, it could be, and just to be, hype, not hyperbolic, but like just absurd, you literally could have a notice of trustee sale where it's like a year in advance, but it, the, the, big, the big nugget of it, it has on November 1st, 2018 at the courthouse of such and such county. At blank time. Blah, blah, blah. This That's property will be offered for auction. Okay. That is the takeaway. Once a notice of trustee has been filed, that is a guaranteed pre-foreclosure. There is no, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, as it is with the appointment of substitute trustee, I'd give it a strong 90 plus percent chance that if an appointment of substitute trustee is filed, that property is going to foreclosure, but it's not guaranteed. Whereas if a notice of trustee sale is filed, you got two different lists there, that is a guaranteed the bank is moving forward. It's not a guarantee that it will foreclose, right. but it is a guarantee that the bank is moving forward because there's a default. And then pretty much everything we talked about, the uh, uh, like the marketing aspect, the negotiating aspect, all that, that's just, you know, it's, it's almost 
the same thing, right? Except for the fact of your house will be sold on such such day. So it does give you a little additional leverage. The negotiations and the marketing between the two lists are very similar. I would change my, my, my wording up a little bit on the appointment of substitute trustee just because it's not a guaranteed foreclosure. But whenever it does come to the notice of trustee sale, that is a guaranteed foreclosure and both leads can be approached in a very similar fashion. My little two cents on this subject is if we are working pre foreclosures right now in a saturated market with a lot of sales going on or a lot of investors, you need to change up your marketing on both of these lead types. I wouldn't recommend really direct mail right now, although direct mail does work. Mm -hmm. It comes at a cost and a volume that many newer investors can't, um, can't obtain, but something that almost every investor can obtain is the ability to door knock and cold call. And I also thoroughly and strongly believe that the investors that are door knocking and cold calling, regardless of their ability to budget a direct mail campaign, will have greater success in this current market because you are going to be able to get to that lead faster than anybody else. And if that is a motivated seller, your ability to contract that property before mail ever even hits that door is much higher. So as far as, first of all, competition shouldn't matter. You're only in competition with your own self and rah, rah, work, do the work. Uh, that being said, because the, going back to the appointment of substitute trustee, that, that is kind of like not most people don't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. Notice trustee sale, I mean, that's pretty obvious what that is. Yep. Does that competition, does it just expand as far as market people, the people in the market actually, you know, targeting them or is it about the same? Appointment of substitute trustee, I'm going to say at this current point in time, in this current market, with my experience, has limited competition in comparison. Right. to the notice of default. The notice of default, the notice of trustee sale, that list is a very easy list to get. There's not, it's not difficult at all to obtain and find that list. Whereas the appointment of substitute trustee is a list that is not offered by very many people at all. And when it is offered, the people out there still are not aware to search for it. Mm -hmm. So it's still a list that has a fairly strong opportunity in there because the following is not as big in that list type so basically what i'm hearing is become the subject matter expert on all things foreclosure and then beat the hell out of those leads i would if, if i was if i was jumping back on on single family investing and i was trying to go at that real hard my main priority would be appointment substitute trustee door knocking and cold calling those lists so if you have questions about what we're talking about today please join in uh the reason we do this on a facebook live versus uh, just to record it and share it out which we do too uh is so we can have that conversation um love the fact that we got you know miranda hello elizabeth helen obviously this is for you uh jason as always lacy daniel jeremy aaron madison ronald yeah hey tang i see that you like my <laughs> uh my card idea you know <laughs> hey if that makes you money kick back uh <laughs> ponchos <laughs> I, want, I want some money anyways but like i said if you have questions please drop them in there uh, if you like what you're seeing please give it a like give it a thumbs up is that a youtube thing i don't know whatever like it share it out there help us get this knowledge out there um to, you know it's all about content content sean burke you, you almost you almost missed your shout out buddy hey micah so anyway um so, moving on. so as far as the no stressy sale you know, I kind of liked your, your, your well, no, I really liked your 30 second elevator pit or pitch uh, explanation for the appointment of trust, 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 I can't talk. You know what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> What's my elevator pitch for a notice of trustee sale? Thank you, sir. All right, so we've already gone through the elevator pitch for the appointments of substitute trustee. Let's talk about the notice of trustee sale. One of the things that I like about the notice of trustee sale is that it is a given date that no matter what, this person is most likely going to go to foreclosure. So the, a lot of the tire kickers that are trying to milk this for every last moment that they can get out of this house, this is a, an opportunity to stick a publicly filed court document in their face and say, on this date, your house is gone. It is your choice right now whether or not you control how your house is sold, but unless you're able to come up with $17,000 in past due payments within the next two weeks, your home sold. So you need to choose right now, do you want to sell it on your terms or the bank's terms? It's an, easy, it's an easier close. So it's basically an easier or a much more uh, faster way to turn the knife. It really is. And it's although good. although I use that phrase a lot, I don't want that to mean in a derogatory no, way no. against the homeowner. But 
I'm going to be very blunt right now, and that is pre-foreclosure people, especially the ones that make it all the way to the end, I consider them to be the biggest deniers of d deniers, deniers. Does sure. that sound right? Deniers of reality. They completely and totally ignore reality. They bury their head in the sand just like an ostrich, and they will ignore every bit of logic and reason that there is. Unless Zillow says their house is worth ten million dollars. Side tangent. I'm going to jump on that for a second. I am working a pre foreclosure lead a couple years ago. Beautiful house over in Grapevine, needs minimal repairs, nice condition. This guy has owned this house for like 23 years and has never refied. So we can imagine the amount of equity that this dumbass has. And I'm saying dumbass right now because he was a dumbass. Mm -hmm. 23 years, he owed maybe 18,000 on the property itself, had probably another 15,000 in child support liens attached to it. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that, I think there was an IRS lien, but in total, his in total encumbrances on the property were maybe about 45,000. Retail value on the property in its as is condition was easily a 140 to 150 ARV, easy. So this guy has well over $100,000 in equity on the line. Right. I get a phone call on a Saturday. Anybody that knows Texas knows <laughs> that Texas Tuesday is when all properties go to auction. So this property is gonna go to auction on Tuesday morning unless this guy does something like file a bankruptcy or whatnot. Something. He calls me up on Saturday and I'm looking at the deal and I'm like, hell yeah, this is a deal. I mean, I can lock this thing up. I can get it closed in a couple, a couple of days, no problem. With the amount of equity you have, yeah. I can get you the equity that you need, but at the same time, I need, to leave a little room on the table for my own profit, but you've got enough wiggle room here. We've got all kinds of options we can do to save your equity and prevent the auction. As is value, 140 to 150. Yeah. I want 160. That's what the seller says. I want $160,000 from my property. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, dumbass, you do realize right? in 72 hours, the bank is going to force your property to be sold at auction and you have zero control over what it sells for at the auction. And if it sells zero. for, yeah, you don't want to put yourself in that position. And I'm offering you an out right now. And he's like, well, my house is worth 160. I'm going to get 160 for it. And I was like, the only way you can get 160 for your house in the next 72 hours is if you have somebody that's willing to pay retail cash for your house, it's not gonna happen. Tomorrow. Well, I've got another investor that said they'd get me 160. Where are they? And he's like, well, I'm gonna contract with them. And I'm like, well, fine, is what it is. Although I have full and total understanding that what that other investor is gonna do is burn you badly. Yeah. But go ahead and gamble that equity away. And then I get a phone call Tuesday morning. And guess what? The buyer changed his offer so about 15,000 less than what I was offering the morning of the foreclosure. And guess who lost every bit of equity because I, can, I can't perform in an hour and a half before an auction. No one can. So I mean, he, the, he lost because it. Because the reality is like, we love our title people, but how many of them are going, because every title person is usually super busy on Tuesday. How many of them are actually gonna be able to answer the phone on a Tuesday morning. The up only option I would have had for securing that property at that speed, and we're getting off topic here, I did go on a tangent. Bankruptcy. The, no bankruptcy because in that particular situation, and this is just me speaking openly, yeah. that seller had a reality problem. And if we would have pushed a bankruptcy in, all I would have done is postpone his reality check. That guy needed a reality check bad because he was not facing what what the terms of, of this was. The only option I would have had at that early of the morning is since I did have some pri preliminary early due diligence, I was able to know what the arrears and what the encumbrances of title were. I could have paid off the arrears, took the property over subject to, and risked losing the initial $17,000 in past due payments. But if there is that big of a nugget on the table, that may have been worthwhile for me. And what I would have done is structured the purchase agreement that said something like, I will pay you X amount of dollars minus all encumbrances and liens. So I would have paid him 85,000 or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But if there were any unknown liens unknown to me, then all of that would have been taken out of his equity. So the takeaway there is you, you, you can't, you can't fight stupid. You really can't. And I, I have to recommend this to anybody out there investing in foreclosures, and that is focus on the people that want help. Just because you have somebody that's 
interested in selling their house, if they're not motivated and you can't bring them to the reality of their current situation, move on down the road. Yeah, because when, when you originally said the house was worth 140, 150, ARV, but he wants 160, all I could think about in my head was just like, you know, slowly backing out, closing the door, and then just not even saying we're just walk away. Yeah. Which I know in the hustler and all of us, that's never going to be a, you're always going to keep going and going and going until it's get the fuck out of my house. But sometimes one of the best like, options for a negotiation is take it off the table. Yeah. If I'm offering you something and you're giving me pushback, just grab it off the table, pick it up, and start walking away. And a lot of times with negotiations, that'll change up the tone some. And, but, and, and speaking of Zillow, I don't want to do it now. I want to finish up what we're talking about, the leads. But at the very end, I kind of want to go into how Zillow, I know you were camping, but on uh, Thursday, Friday, Zillow made an announcement they're going to get in the single family game. So They're going to try and do the open door thing? or well, They're going to buy houses. But uh -oh. I want to go into it at the end just because there are a lot of people like, oh, no, what's it going to do? But it's simmer down. It's not that big a deal. So, right. uh, what, okay, so we got a couple other leads. We got probates, we got list pendants. What else we got? We've got probates, list pendants, and affidavits of airship. And to answer your question, Tina, uh, we did already talk about the appointment and removal of trustee. That was at the very beginning. But feel free when this show is over to rewind and watch that again. So feel free to go for that. But let's go ahead and talk about the third and final piece in regards to the list that we provide. The first two lead lists that we were talking about were for non-judicial states. The last list that we're going to discuss is going to be Liz Pendens. Liz Pendens work in mortgage foreclosures, also known as judicial foreclosures. So if you are in a judicial state, go ahead and Google judicial versus non-judicial foreclosures and you'll find out which state you're in. Liz Pendens is Latin for pending lawsuit. So if you are in a state that is judicial, your foreclosure process is controlled through the courts. In non-judicial states, your foreclosure process is due process. Basically, the state says you have to do these 10 things, and if you do these th 10 things on time and per the law, you can foreclose without involving a court. Well, there are many states out there that do not allow anyone to foreclose unless they first appear in front of a judge. So what we're going to find out is that in judicial states, mortgage states, that whenever somebody wants to are going to go file and petition the courts to open up a court case, it's essentially a lawsuit against the homeowner. What the banks are doing is suing the homeowner for the house. And what's gonna happen is that they, they're gonna go before the judge, and part of this process is going to be a document filed in public record called the Liz Pendens, L-I-S-P-E-N-D-E-N-S, which is Latin for pending lawsuit. Once that is filed, that is public notice to everybody out there that this property is going to go to foreclosure. Now let me so, show some contrast here. In judicial states, especially Arizona and Texas, the non-judicial foreclosure process is generally extremely fast. In Texas, two to three months, no problem. Arizona, same, two to three months, no problem. It can move forward really fast. Most non-judicial states of foreclosure can happen in anywhere between three to six months. Now, if we look at the contrast and look at judicial foreclosures going through the court systems, going through the full-blown lawsuit, those are often nine months to two years. So there's different ways to market these to these two groups. If I'm in a non-judicial state, I need to move extremely fast, not only because of competition, but because the time to get this property closed is limited. Whereas in judicial areas, you know, I might be able to market to this person for six or seven months. That's unheard of here in Texas. That's not something I can do in Texas because my foreclosure process is so fast. So if you are on a non or in a judicial state, Liz Pendens is going to be a document that you're looking for, and that's going to be a document filed in public record saying there is a pending lawsuit attached to this house. That's pretty straightforward. Now, going back to the same question I asked on the other two, where, where does timeline? Is, is, there, is this a one day before? Is this a thousand days before? Or is it kind of like it's on the attorney's schedule? Because, you know, attorneys, got to love them, but they're on their own schedule where they're just busy. So they urgent to them may be a year and a half from now. Okay. So my question is, we got the, uh, you know, the list pendants out there. We got the notification of list pendants. It's pending lawsuit. Now is that, hey, 30 days out? Is that a 60 day out? Or is that a, we have no clue? That is something I'm going to have to defer to Google. 
because I'm not a subject matter expert in all the different states. I work in Texas, so Texas questions are questions I can answer relatively easy. But in judicial states, I don't have that much experience. Mm -hmm. My experience in judicial foreclosures is, is limited to my my own pursuit of knowledge. I haven't technically invested in non -judi in judicial foreclosures. So what I'm gonna have to say is, what I do know is that the process is much longer, and that if you are in a judicial state, you have more time to market to them, and there may be nuances that you will find as you start marketing to foreclosures in your state that are similar to the appointment of substitute trustee. I know that like when the Liz Pendens is filed, that there is at that point in time more than likely not a sale date set because they have to get the judge's approval. Mm -hmm. So I'm also going to assume that there will be documents filed in public record notifying everybody of when the sale date is going to occur and what date it was set for. These are all assumptions, but you out there in the land of Facebook will need to dig in and learn a little bit more about your state in particular. So if you're out there watching and you have that knack and that itch and that urge to get more information, and you find a good information source on this penance, drop in the comments, share, share with the class. A resource that I cannot directly cite, but I'm pretty sure it's correct, is nolo.com, N-O-L-O.com. If I recall, that one is a good resource for learning more about, about basic, basic laws and foreclosure processes in general. And there's another one out there that I can't really remember, but if you watch our foreclosure training video in the Academy when we release it, I'll have links to all of that in there. Cool. Okay, so we've gone through three of the list types so far. Appointment substitute trustee, notice of trustee sales, and list pendants. All three of those are pre-foreclosure leads or potential pre-foreclosure leads. And the main differences between them is the times that they're filed and the type of foreclosure that it is. So, okay, let's, let's move on to probates. Okay, so now that we are in here on, on probates. Nice to see you here, Paul. Uh, nice to see you there, Aaron, Melody, Paul, Marquise, Lorenzo. Thank you for tuning in. So... Right now, let's move on to the next two list types. And I can break these five lists into two pretty much buckets. One's pre-foreclosure and the other one's inherited property leads. So let's talk about probates and let's see what probates are and how they work for us as a real estate investor. So when somebody owns real property and they pass, that real property needs to be transferred via several different means. There's many different ways that it can be done. It can be transferred through trusts. It can be transferred through, uh, through a deed, through affidavits of heirship, through probates, through wills. There's many ways to do that. Monuments of title, close, uh, quiet title, many ways to transfer the ownership from that decedent. And I do want to define that for a second because I do have a lot of people that confuse when I use the word decedent, not de uh, descendant. Descendant has that in hidden in the middle somewhere. Decedent is the person that died. Descendant is somebody further down the family tree. Mm -hmm. Don't get yourself confused because like whenever we put out our probate list, it's going to have a column that says decedent mm -hmm. and people will start marketing to the decedent thinking it is the descendant. So real quick side, side tip for you. Descendant means the person is dead, or not descendant, decedent means they have deceased, and descendant means it is like not necessarily an heir, but somebody further down the family tree in that line. I appreciate that, Aaron. Love you too, man. I, you've been following us for a couple of years now. I appreciate all the love that you give us. So, probates. Let's talk about probates. Probate is one way to transfer title to real estate, and that can be either with a will or without a will. Now those two terms are called testate, T-E-E-T-E-S-T-A-T-E. -E -E. Testate means I have died and I have a will. And then you also have what's known as intestate, I-N-T-E-S-T-A-T-E. -E. Testate means I have passed away but I have a will in place that the probate courts will work through. Intestate means I've died, I do not have a will and the courts will disperse the real property in accordance with that state's intestate laws. In Texas, we can talk about that a little bit, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about affidavits of heirship, because that is more pertinent to the affidavits of heirship. But essentially what we can find with the probate is where a homeowner has passed, and they are now in the process of more than likely liquidating some of the assets, whether that's personal assets or real assets there is a very high probability that that asset will be sold. Because whenever an executor, an executrix, let's talk about that for a minute, 
whenever I petition the courts to open a probate case, the courts are going to want to pro, pro, not promote, are going to want to put somebody in charge of, excuse me, this process. That person is going to either be called the executor, executrix, or the ad administrator of the estate. It is that person's job. I say that person's. It may be multiple of people. Sometimes that is dictated in the will. I want this person to be in charge of my estate. If not, the court will choose who that's going to be. And it's normally a family member, an heir, the oldest heir, or the heirs will elect somebody to do that for them. But it's the executor's job, administrator's slash executrix's job, to handle the settling of affairs for that estate, whether that's bank accounts, real estate, personal property, debts, that is their job to get that settled and wrap this probate up. You, as a real estate investor, might be so inclined to reach out to this administrator. I'm just gonna continue calling them administrators for simplicity. Wrap them all in one bucket. Wrap them all up in one bucket. I'm gonna reach out to that administrator and say, hey, the property that you are currently in charge of may or may not have real estate that you are wanting to sell as part of that. If you would like to sell the real estate, we are here and able to quickly liquidate real estate on your behalf in a short period of time. If that is something that interests you, give me a call back. Now, the reason I say this is quite often whenever an executor or administrator of the estate takes over a property, especially a property that has debt attached to it as well, then there's now a mortgage every single month on this deceased homeowner's property that needs to be paid. Mm -hmm. Many times there is not enough or sufficient funds in that deceased person's bank accounts to continue making those payments for any lasting period of time. So then it will become the pr problem or the responsibility of the administrator of that estate to make those payments moving forward. More often than not, that administrator cannot afford to make the house payment on the deceased homeowner's property as well as make their own financial obligations whole. So more often than not, the deceased property will start falling behind on payments. And you as a real estate investor, you pose an opportunity for this administrator to liquidate the estate amongst all the other things that they have going on right now with very little to no hassle. Mm -hmm. And many times administrators of estates want this. The, although, you know, some people may look at this as, you know, ambulance chasers or that stuff like that. We provide a service to the administrators of the estate. Just as somebody that's willing to come in and do an estate sale for this administrator, somebody that's willing to come in and provide funeral services or anything else in between, attorneys that are willing to handle this probate process, it is a service. Mm -hmm. I am not in any way trying to dupe or con this person into liquidating that asset to me. I'm essentially extending my hand saying, here is a service that I provide if you need it. Right. And honestly, that is the best approach that I've ever received going after probates is approaching that seller, that administrator with the mindset of I am providing a service. If this is a service that you want, here's how you can get in touch with me. So when I first started marketing to probates, I got a lot of negative feedback for my marketing. I was trying that traditional what I thought would have been the proper way to approach that lead. Which would be, on a, on a whim, I, and I'm assuming it was, my condolences for your loss, let me know if I can help you, I'm interested in buying the house, that kind of thing. Exactly. Um, Which typically it, don't work. It, it, I really found on my particular marketing that the sympathetic approach did not work, and the reason that is is because everybody knows it's bullshit. They know for a fact that yes, their father just passed away and less than two weeks later, they're now receiving a letter from you saying, oh, I'm so sorry that your father has passed away. Let me buy the house. They know that that's not genuine. They know that that's bullshit and they see right through it and it irritates them. And I can understand and respect why. So I completely changed my marketing up to essentially say, we are a real estate service provider that provides these types of services. Bank, 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 bank. Close the ar not argument, close the letter up. And I got extensive response from that type of marketing because I wasn't trying to hide what I was doing behind fake false sympathy. Does that make sense? It did, but then I had another, going back to earlier in the video about the whole Rihanna envelope, 
if you had that money, money, money. <laughs> like when they open up the letter, it's like, oh, it's man. like, I'm sorry for your loss, but money, money, money. Another one bites the dust. Oh, that'd be horrible. That would be absolutely horrible. But, but to, to wrap that up, because, uh, uh, well, not because, um, basically probate is just the lawyer speak device of somebody's dead, let's disperse their, their shit. Yep. Um, real quick plug for a video I did we like two weeks ago with uh, Brandon McGee. Oh yeah, that was great. We did a full on just meat heavy. Uh, what is a probate? Um, uh, if we can get that link down below, that'd be great. Yeah, that was like two weeks ago, and literally it was just kind of like, I mean, you know, attorney just spitting out all the stuff that you wish you knew, and you're like, and then at the end you're like, okay, so I just need to know, I need to market to this guy. For those of you that enjoyed the uh, presentation by Brandon where he was talking about the deceased homeowner process of getting that property transferred, yeah. we actually have him coming into the academy to teach a full class on all of this in a very much presentation lecture style. So look forward to that in the academy as well coming soon. Hey, nice to see you there, Bryce. I uh, appreciate you tuning in there, Miranda, Shelby. It's good seeing you all here. Uh, Sean had a quick question about our probate leads. Um, he was saying, uh, do the, uh, the, oh, great do question. The probate, I can't, I can't do, not read today. Do your probate leads have real estate or do you do we have to research the lead? Great question and I'm going to provide you with a great answer. We do that hard work for you. We look at the probate filings, uh, at least in the counties where we pull them. Whenever the probate filing is recorded, there's going to be a division of assets. And one of it's, well, it's going to say estimated value of real property. And it's also going to have another column It's going to say estimated value of personal property. Well, if I'm looking at those asset columns and I see that in the real estate column that there is any number at all, I now know that that homeowner owns real estate. And now, <coughs> excuse me, I have to go through the tedious job of finding that real estate because it is not recorded in the probate filing. It's not saying they own XYZ address, XYZ address, ABC address. They don't say that. All they say is the estimated value of the real property is $400,000. It is now my job to try and figure out what real property that decedent owned. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the county of death of the decedent, and I'm, all, I'm gonna assume that that decedent likely lived in that county, and then I am going to search public records, also known as the Central Appraisal District, for that homeowner's name. And then when I search for that homeowner's name, I will hopefully find what I anticipate with my best belief to be the decedent's real property. So it is a tedious task, but we do that for you. But for the most part, it's simple, it's just it's simple, but it is time consuming. Definitely time consuming. Um, hey, Brandon Richards, appreciate you watching us today. Aaron had a, uh, what about probates that are listed with a realtor? How would you handle that? Probates that are listed with a realtor, I would make my offer directly to the real estate agent. And, you know, depending upon your license status, if I'm a licensed realtor, I can't do this. But if the realtor is impeding the process of a, of a, I'm not even going to say that. I have my own opinions on that, but we'll move on down the road because I'm not going to get into that. Disclaimer here at Propelio, <laughs> we love realtors. I love realtors, but there are times when realtors stand in the way of the seller's best interests because of their own, I'm going to assume, ignorance, and I'm just going to state it at that. But I love realtors. I work with realtors, real estate agents all the time. I, I have no qualms with them at all. But whenever you have an agent that is strictly nothing but focusing on their commission and not really taking into consideration the best opportunity for that seller, they're doing a disservice. Mm -hmm. um, Shelby, to what you just said about uh, doing the sympathetic route, great. What works for you, that's great. But when you look like my, me or, or this guy, you know, I, I think people read bullshit. You know, I mean, I, yes, I'd, I'd be interested in in hate that somebody's loved one has passed away, but I'm not reaching out to say, "Hey, how are you?" It's I well, want to buy your house. With my original probate letter, you know, it was a very sympathetic tone. 
with my with my with my my second version of a different type of letter it was very business professional stating services provided etc there was it's not as though that that letter was void of sympathy but it was strictly a simple sentence versus a paragraph riddled throughout the the letter it was essentially our company's condolences for your loss if you are in need of these types of services blank that's all I ever touched on, and my response rate went through the roof whenever I shifted my marketing to that strategy. So whatever works for you, man, is whatever works for you. So I know we, we're, we're, I think we wrapped up on what we list in the description. Nope, but we still have affidavits of airship left. Ah. Affidavits of airship left, and that is one of the ones that we catch a lot of it. people. Oh, we didn't? But it's okay, because I've thought of some oh. other lists, too, that we can go into after this. My bad. Let's talk about affidavits of airship, because that is the one that probably pulls a considerable amount of confusion from people, um, especially newer investors. So like we said, two different buckets that we can essentially group these five leads into, one of which is pre-foreclosure, the other one is an inherited property. So if we get in touch with a seller that has inherited property, how do I say that? That is in line, that's the best way. If I, if, I have, if I reach out and I market to a property that I want to purchase, but I find out that the homeowner has died, then what I can do is seek out the people that are potential heirs to that property, talk with them and say, hey, I know that this property was once owned by your uncle, would you please sell it? It shows that you are in now in, potentially in chain of title, would you like to work with me on selling that property? So if there was no will in place, which is very often the case in situations like this, if there is no will in place as a real estate investor, I have several options for transferring title. One of which is probate. That's the one we just discussed. That would be petitioning the court for the court's involvement to get this asset transferred from the decedent onto the heirs or whoever was assigned in the will. Mm -hmm. Option number two, which is used very often and is preferred by most real estate investors, in my opinion, for transferring title because of its speed and efficiency is what's gonna be called an affidavit of airship. It's an affidavit, it's a sworn statement. And what we look at, and this is where we're gonna talk about that side tangent I took earlier, testate versus intestate. If it is a testate property with a will, you cannot do an affidavit of airship Correct me if I'm wrong. I may be wrong on that. I'm not a lawyer. My experience says if there's a will in place, we need to have it probated. But if there's no will in place, we go through what's called the intestis, intestis, I'm just going to call it the intestate chart. I was trying to say a different word, but we're going to call it the intestate chart. And what that's essentially going to do, in Texas, I have that chart reasonably well memorized. In Texas, if I pass away, my rights are going to first go down and sideways. Sideways being my, my wife, my wife and down. So to my children and to my wife, that's where it's gonna go. So meaning if I own a house with a wife and I have three kids, it's split up into four equal shares. Depends on how the title to the property was held. So there's several things to look at there, but more than likely my rights are gonna go down to my kids and my wife, or excuse me, my rights will go down to my kids. My wife's rights will remain whole in their part. Right. So that is, and go talk to a probate attorney, but they go to my kids first. But what happens if I don't have kids? Or what happens if my kid has died? Well, then it would then go to their kids. But if I get all the way down the chain and there's no one to take title, then it goes up. It's gonna to go to my parents. If my parents are not there, then it's going to go sideways to my brothers and sisters. If my brothers and sisters are alive, then they get my property. But if my brothers and sisters are not alive, then if, they, if I had nieces and nephews, it goes sideways and then down again. If it doesn't go down at all, then I don't really remember what happens from there. You need to have somebody come into play. But in Texas, for the most part, it goes down, up sideways mm -hmm. so kind of an easy way to remember it but as far as the, the the lead standpoint it's just another way of saying oh by the way morbid humor somebody's dead they probably have a house they need to get rid of yep okay so let's drill into this a little bit further so affidavits of airship is a way to push ownership of a property down to the heirs mm -hmm. One of the things as a real estate investor that we have been doing 
is pulling affidavit of airship filings from public record as a source to market to. Now let me go ahead and take care of a couple of issues with that right there. Affidavits of airship are often filed as a part of curative title work at a title company. So if an affidavit of airship is filed, there is a reasonably high chance that that affidavit of airship was filed in the process of transferring the home ownership. So for me as a real estate investor, probably not the best lead, you know, but one of the things that I do like about affidavits of airship is that there are not a whole lot of them filed every month. There's not thousands and thousands of affidavits of airships filed every month. We might be talking about a couple hundred a month filed, but out of those couple hundred, let's say 140 to 150 of them are already being sold. That's wasted marketing on my behalf. Right. But one of the nicest things that I do like about that list is that it, since there is such a small limited number of affidavits of airship filed every month, I may waste some marketing dollars on those, those leads that are nothing, but it doesn't cost me a lot of money. But the remaining you know, 50 to 75 that were actually being transferred because the homeowner or the heirs could not afford the traditional probate route, they chose to go the affidavit of airship route because it is substantially cheaper then those are really good leads for me to market to. Right. It, go, it goes back to that whole, uh, earlier we were talking about the appointment of uh, substitute trustee where you have a large bucket and, and maybe there's only a couple misfires. This one's almost the, the, the flip side where there's a small bucket and most of them are misfires, but the ones that are good are going to be good. But because it's so cheap to market to all of them. Might as well. Why the hell not? So that is my take on affidavits of airship. Affidavits of airship essentially a homeowner has passed away and somebody has filed an affidavit of heirship to transfer the ownership to the heirs. So in that particular list, I want to market to the heirs directly. Uh, there won't be an administrator, there won't be an executor, there won't be anything like that. I'm going to market to the heirs directly and solicit the sale of that property. Most of the time though, when you're marketing to them, that property has already been sold or is in the process of being sold. So keep that in mind, you're gonna get people that say, it's already sold, I've already sold it. It's not because we're providing a bad list, it's just a large majority of the people in that list are already in the process of selling that home. But I still recommend selling it to or marketing to it because there's just a limited number of them and the few that haven't sold their home yet are excellent leads. There you go. Um, so. It's kind of a long episode today, so get your question in, questions in quickly. Give us some likes, give us some shares. Uh, I do have two other lists I want to go into. Uh, you know, the uh, equity list and then tax delinquency list. Um, Let's start with the equity list first. Uh, that's something that uh, my old, the company I used to work, that's where I was trained, which was pull a giant two million person list and then just start whittling down through the tax records. Not tax delinquency, just the county records of trying to find the equity spread, trying to okay. find who's owned it for you know, 10, 15, 20 years plus, um, and you know, just whittling that list down. Uh, that, it's, it, that, that's the equity list, right? That's basically what's called tax rolls list, equity list. High equity lists, that's yeah. what most people call them. The, the thing about those is when you're in a market like DFW, if you're direct mailing that, you can be successful. But the barrier to entry into that type of play is huge because there's people throwing out 20, 30, 50,000 mail pieces a month. And I, I know 20,000 postcards cost about eight grand. So they're spending 16 to 20 grand a month in postcards. Uh, An alternative to that though, is you can still door knock, you can still cold call, right. you can still still approach that list in a fashion that might be a little more boots on the ground and work for you, but it's it's still opportunity. But, but the whole play there is you have a tax roll list, you're whittling it down. Uh, I want everybody that's owned their house more than 20 years. I want everybody that has uh, between a, an 80,000 and 300,000 ARV, and then you whittle it down to the areas you want to go to. Um, and, and then hyper focus on and, it. And, yeah, and, and, and it's kind of a shotgun. It, it's not a targeted list. It's kind of targeted, but it's it, not. It, it, has its, it has its points. I mean, well, the, the point being the, equity. The, the, the equity is because equity is king. On those houses, guess what? If you're targeting uh, the, the super targeted leads, mm -hmm. 
guess what you're not targeting? You're not targeting the mom and pop that just, you know, they want to move to Florida. Right. And they have a house that's, you know. <laughs> so that's how you get kind of like the other. So like in my experience in real estate career, that's the only thing we market. We market that and probates. All this other stuff Daniel's talking about, that's more laser focused and really targeted. But the tax rolls list, the equity list, that's... That's I mean, pretty huge. It's a huge list and you're going to be able to uh, find less competition, but more competition. And what I mean by that is... There's more houses. There's more houses, but and there's more opportunity to get into houses that nobody else is seeing. But And, but, and that's what I mean by the less competition, but at the same time, because the barriers to entry that is, I just go to the county records and pull a list. Right. And then, and then it's just a matter of how much money do I have. <laughs> so you, it is very successful, but if, you, if you're if you starting out and don't have money, you might want to skip that one unless you just want to door knock. Door knocking, I love. It, it's, I, I'm not going to say I love it because I don't love it, but I love the results. Mm -hmm. So it is great. So, so you said you had some other lists? I would just say tax delinquency list. Tax delinquency. I've never marketed to that list. I haven't either, but uh, if you ever have, let us hear about it. Um, basically, I'm assuming it's people are late on their taxes. <laughs> and they're about to lose their house to taxes. Uh, so that's what that list is. Uh, water list, that's obviously people that are, you know, uh, Daniel did a class a couple of weeks ago. He's actually going to teach it here at the San Antonio RA meetup and the Houston, Houston meetup and the DFW RA meetup. Yep. Uh, but that's simply, hey, an indicator that A, they're, they can't pay their bills, the They've house had, is vacant, mm -hmm. they're moved out, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's many things that are that are good to think of on the, on the water list, and we'll save that for another day. We do have some recorded presentations on how to secure water lists. Water lists are vacant properties and stuff like that, but we will be teaching that at the upcoming Rhea's, uh, Rhea meetups in San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, moving forward, let's take a couple yeah, of questions Mark from the people here in the crowd. I have okay. a house the daughter of the deceased never knew he had a house how do I get her the proper info for to help her? Okay. Hey, Reese. Hey, Colby. Thanks for watching. I just saw y'all jump in there. So let me see that question there. I don't see it on the big screen. For those of you that see my eyes continuously darting off to the side, we have a, uh, a movie theater screen over there with all of the questions popping up on them. Where, where is that? Okay. So I have a house. The daughter of the deceased never knew he had a house. How do I get the, her, the proper info to help her? Wow, that sounds like an absolutely amazing lead, Marquise. And we can follow up on that phone call after this, <laughs> after this conversation. For those of you that don't know, Marquise and I are really good friends from way back in, back in the day. Um, Marquise, that sounds like a great lead, but for everybody that's watching, what, I'm, what, what I would do is I have a house, the daughter of the deceased never knew he had a house. How do I get her the proper info to help her? What I would likely do in that lead is I would contract the, owner, the, the property with the daughter. I would probably approach the daughter and just say, hey, to get this ball rolling, it's going to cost me money to get this moving forward. Otherwise, you know, the probate attorneys, the affidavits, all that's gonna cost several thousands of dollars. I can go ahead and cover those costs for you, but let's go ahead and come to an agreement on what you'd be willing to sell this house for. Here's what I'd be willing to offer, and this is just a very short overview. I would get the property under contract with that daughter, then I would get it to title. Once I got it to title, I would see what's encumbering the, the ownership of that home. Encumbrances meaning, what kind of liens do I have? What kind of judgments? What kinds of, of uh, um, you know, AJs? What, what all is going on on title? And then from there, I would let the title company determine who ownership needs to transfer to. And if it's more than just the daughter, I would get the rest of the family to get on board with signing all the documents necessary to purchase the house. And then I'd move forward with filing affidavits of airship to transfer ownership to the heirs, which would allow me to move forward and purchase the property. So right now there's going to be a lot of due diligence. And the first thing I would do is contract it, trying to determine all heirs to the property with the assistance of a title company, and then move forward with the purchase of that property. Mm -hmm. uh, Miranda, she was asking a question about the events that we're having. Uh, for the most part, yes, the events will be the same. There are a couple of the, the smaller, uh, the quick REI talks that will change up, and there are going to be different vendors at every event. But for the most part, uh, the goal is to, even though it's a lot of work, try to make it as little less work if I am able to make it to where they're all the same. Uh, that being said, if you want to come to all, 
<laughs> I'll buy you your first drink. Um, Carlos Alvarez, do you provide these lists in Florida? We do provide Liz Pendens in Florida, in Fort Myers area, in the Miami, Miami Dade area. We do provide those Liz Pendens lists. I don't know if we provide the probates there yet or not, but I do at the very least know we provide Liz Pendens in those areas of Florida. But we do have like the Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, Daytona Beach, Jacksonville. All those areas are pending release as we speak. And Carlos, uh, thank you for, for checking in. Um, you know, hopefully we've got a ton of backlog videos that you should check out. And uh, we'll, we'll find out what we're actually doing in Florida and get that back to you here later this, uh, today. Um, got a question here from Kyle Garner, it looks like. It's a big one. See so, more. So I have a question. So this is for you, Kyle. I have a question. A friend of mine has a mother who has a house and her stepfather just passed. Her stepsisters are threatening to take the house away from the mother. Deed and foundation was done five months prior to marriage in 1999. There was no will. Does the mother have any equitable interest in the home? One probate attorney that they spoke with stated that she does not due to the house being in the dead husband's name prior to marriage. What I am leaning towards right now from my experience is that has a, a state of truth to a statement of truth to it. I'm not an attorney and I would, I'd lean towards what that attorney has said is true. But if the ownership of the home was recorded prior to the marriage and that the mother did not contribute to the payments of that home in any way, then they have no equitable interest in the property from my experience. Now, also, if the mother has made payments toward that house through a joint bank account, through things like that, there may, there may be some equitable interest in that property of which I cannot determine. It might be best to talk to another probate attorney. Brandon McGee was an attorney that we had on here a couple weeks ago. He specializes in nothing but probates, and he does offer a free one-hour consultation. So don't forget, reach out to Brandon McGee, McGee Law Firm. They're at 810 West 10th Street. I don't get paid for this referral. 810 West 10th Street, Fort Worth, Texas, 817-377-9009. I work with them so much that I have that memorized. Reach out to Brandon McGee, free one-hour consultation. Mention that you saw this here on Propelio, and he may even give you an extra half hour on top of that. So uh, I really wish I could answer that. I really, I, I really wish I could answer the question better for you there. But from what I'm seeing there, what he has stated is more than probably correct. But you might be able to throw a caveat to that, and that is if the mother has paid any of her cash towards the property, it may allow a little bit of gray area to form so think about that okay so georgette jones nice for, thank you for uh tuning in and watching us there thank you carlos uh let's take a look at that thank you renee i have a meeting with a receiver of a vacant home on tuesday due to the previous couple going through a divorce i have told her of my interest and wanted to know what would be the process to secure the property is it just to submit a contract and wait for approval by the judge? Okay, so I'm gonna need you to, if you're still there, Georgette, I'm gonna need you to clarify a couple of questions for me. I have a meeting with the receiver of a vacant home on Tuesday due to the previous couple going through a divorce. Who has current title to the property? And whoever has current title to the property, is it a his and hers couple? Is it, is it a couple? Is it a single owner? What's going on there? Is that person deceased? And then we're adding a second motivator into that. We've got several motivating factors going on with this property. One, it sounds like there may have been a deceased homeowner involved. Two, there's a divorce involved. Three, there's a vacant property involved. Sounds like there's all kinds of things brewing to make this lead a potential lead that could pan out and provide some really good stuff. So, okay, so it is with the couple. So we have no deceased homeowners here at all. Is that correct, Georgette? We are working on a delayed feed. So you may not hear this question for another 30 seconds or so. Okay, thank you for watching, Daniel. Okay, so Georgette, so it is with the couple. So anytime I'm dealing with a divorce, there are three questions that I'm gonna They're ask. They're not divorced yet. They're not divorced yet? Yeah, she's okay. going through a divorce. So that's what I need to clarify. And I need to clarify, there's three questions I need to ask. And that is, are y'all talking about divorce, but haven't filed yet? Have y'all filed, but not completed? 
or have you filed and already completed? Those are the three questions that I need to know and understand. If they have not filed, but are considering the divorce, and they are amicable together with the sale, and you can move the sale forward with both of them, postpone the filing of the divorce, get the property sold with the homeowners, and that will save you significant troubles moving forward if both homeowners are amicable. If one's like flat out refusing to, then what's gonna have to happen is the divorce is going to have to be filed. If the divorce is filed, then you are not going to be able to buy the house until the court signs off on that for you. Until the court comes up and says, you know what, we will allow this property to be sold under these conditions and the divisions of the assets will occur in this manner. You will have to get that from the courts in order to buy. If the divorce has already been completed, then you're gonna need to get a certified copy of the divorce records to find out what happened with the real property because the divorce records or the divorce decree is going to say what to do. And the title company is going to request that and they're gonna need that. And that divorce record is going to tell you who to contract with. Anytime I'm dealing with a property, I contract with anybody that's willing to sign and then I figure out the details later. Maybe I only got 50% of the total people needed to sign to sign, but at least I can get somebody to commit and then once I've got that commitment made, I will work with title to find out exactly who needs to sign and then try to progress that and move that forward as it moves forward. She said it's been put, it's already been filed and completed, but it's been put with the receiver and it's vacant. I don't directly understand the receiver status. Yeah, I, don't know I, what that is either. I personally, and I don't know what state you're in, I personally have not specifically targeted divorces, but because of my investing experience, I come across a lot of them. So my understanding of the complete and total divorce process is not my specialty. I'm a foreclosure kind of guy, but from my experience, you may want to talk to the receiver and possibly get them to sign the contract. If it doesn't need it, they don't need it. But I would possibly also ask for a certified copy of the divorce decree, see what was stated in there for the real estate or real property. You could probably look that up in public record yourself, mm -hmm. figure out who owns the property, go get contracts. I go get anything signed I can get signed yeah. and then just move forward with title. And if it gets to the end and I miss the signature and that signature is unwilling to work with me, then who cares? At least I got the process working. Yeah, that's so what I was gonna say is like, if you, if you know the players involved and they all vocally say who owns what go get it inked up and then let your and then go find another house and let your title person do all the crazy hard work yep hey That's jason hey Portia, thanks for tuning in uh tina thank you for tuning back in so yeah georgette are really the best the, the best advice that i can give is get that property locked up with whoever you can get the property locked up with and then from that point just let the title tell you exactly like yeah, you said i mean I think too often it's like, yeah, we get in the weeds of specific details, but once you get the contract, let lean on your title company to do their damn job. And I don't mean that in a mean way, but I mean in a like you want your a job, title company your, that you your only conversations are, hey, I have a contract, and when can I pick up my check? <laughs> you, and all the other conversations are like, hey, you know, social. You don't want the back and forth. I've, I've said it here before, where if a title company is like, what kind of service do you want? run away you want to talk to a company to tell you what they need not what you want from them so yeah georgette go ahead and get the contract from whoever you can get it to shoot it over title title will figure that out and during that time go out and grab a couple of more contracts and if this one particularly you contracted with the wrong person at least the title company will point you in the right direction and go get that inked up so um Another thing that you may be able to do, Georgette, is if you are in a state of limbo where you're just completely and totally unaware of what's to happen, give Shyla Trout a call. I don't know, you said you're in, in Texas, so Shyla can definitely help you. But Shyla Trout, her name is S-H-Y-L-I-A. That is the escrow officer that I use on all of my properties for at least five or six years now. I have closed a large number of properties with her. She is an absolute godsend to me. Reach out to her though and say, hey, this is what's going on, and Shyla will tell you specifically from her aspect as an escrow officer closing title for you, she'll tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, that'll work out for you. Her phone number is 817-377-9009. Yeah, it could be a mistake, but I think Georgette was actually at the Jawad's class he did you know, several months ago. Remember okay, that? cool. I, I, I could be mistaken. I, I don't know. Thanks for tuning in, Lacey. Thanks for the, for the feedback there, Portia. Uh, thank you for dropping that in the comments for us, Miranda. So uh, we're wrapping up. So if you have any other questions, drop them in. If you're in San Antonio, next Monday on April 23rd, we're having an event at the Josephine Theater. On Tuesday, we'll be in Houston, uh, the 24th, and we'll be at the Lions Heart Studio there. And in Dallas, we'll be here May 7th uh, at the Palace Theater in Grapevine. 
Um, so as you know, because there's that lag, what I would like to say is get on my little Zillow soapbox real quick because it was announced uh, late last week that Zillow wasn't going to get in the single family game. And people are like, what does that mean? It's like, chill. First of all, you could a simple Google search will see that the volume of any, if you add up all the hedge funds and all the big players, they may own what, 150, 300,000 houses and a population of how many houses in the, in, right. in the United States? We're talking 330 million plus or whatever. So if you just look at Dow, or, and, and, and I did a quick Google search of Zillow, it said they're looking to buy 300 to 1,000 houses in the next year. That's not a massive 1, volume. 300 to houses in the entire United States, even if that was all in one market, that is nothing. Hell, Bryce McKinley does that on his own. On a Tuesday. <laughs> so, so anybody that you know freaks out about the competition aspect of Zillow, just 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 simmer down. It's not a big deal because even if they're even if you multiply that by ten and they're doing three thousand to ten thousand houses a year, the volume is still so it's insignificant. It's still so insignificant. It should have no bearing on your your consciousness whatsoever. That reminds me of a statement that Grant Kemp would state. Uh, he's going to be here on Wednesday doing the Grant Teach Me Something. Be sure to tune in. He drops golden nuggets like like just bombs. But he always says that's like two fleas arguing over who Saint Bernard it is. I mean, there really is no competition on that. I mean. Uh, really, whenever you take into consideration two fleas and a Saint Bernard, there's more than enough meat to go around. Right. So don't 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 be fearful so, of that. And if you think I'm full of BS, just Google it. Google like you know all your head. How many houses do hedge funds on? Blah 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 blah. You know, even if it's a million houses all combined, that's still insignificant in, in all the population. So I think we're wrapping this up. We're coming to an end. This was a slightly longer class, but I think we were able to get some nuggets out there for you. I think so. Uh, and uh, for those of you that have yet checked out, please go to Propelio.com. That's P-R-O-P-E-L-I-O.com to kind of take a look at some of the software tools we provide real estate investors. If you need lead lists just like the ones we discussed, if you need MLS comps, if you need you know an investor website for your business, you want to go in there and buy a I buy houses domain and get your own investing website up and going, please check out Propelio.com. That is the whole reason why we're here. We're trying to bring about some awareness to the products that we have. No hard sales here. Seven day free trial. Eighty nine dollars a month no up sales no big crazy nothing no contracts go check us out seven day free trial worst case scenario you don't like the product i hope that's not the case but i believe that our product is substantially better than most of what you're going to see on the market so go check it out and hopefully you stick with us yeah and before we head out i just want to give a couple of shout outs you know uh this this whole topic was because helen sons was like hey can you go into this so if you have ideas if you have questions Drop them in the comments. Send us some DMs. Um, you know, we're here to serve. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Renee, thanks for watching. Colby, welcome back, man. It's been a minute. I, I, I think your your job schedule kept you away from it a little bit, but I'm glad you're watching live. Andre, welcome. Hey, Renee Daniel. Kyle, welcome. Micah, I'll see you next Monday in San Antonio, buddy. Portia, thanks for watching. Ronald. Daniel, Tina, thank you everybody for watching. That's all. We'll thank you everybody. You. Thank you everybody for but, uh, tuning in. Thank you for helping us out. And we'll see you next time. And again, if you like what you see, give us some likes, give us some shares, comment below what you want to see more of. Tag some friends. Tag some friends. Tag. Don't just tag me. Tag everybody. <laughs> anyway, we'll see you next time. All right.